Dybala! He is something else. Di Lorenzo, and still Di Lorenzo! The captain brings the house down. Antelopea champions once again, but the 33-year wait will now officially come to an end. Ciao ragazzi and welcome to season eight of Serie A Sit Down World Football Index's podcast for your Calcio to go. I'm the newly speckled. Uh, is that what they, they say? That's what they say, Richard. Did I get it right? Yep, I yeah, believe newly, so. Yeah, Frank Crivello. He's Richard Carmen. I just can't believe you've you've tolerated me for eight years my wife's tolerated me for 15 uh well 18 if you include dating but i mean man i mean and i, and I got friends that have tolerated me for you know even longer than that but man eight eight years man this is this is crazy how are you let me talk to you i'm doing well man i'm doing well it's been a summer we've been together quite a while uh last year we mentioned we've been together longer than some married couples it continues to be true we grind it out that's a true married couple i guess i'm gonna diverge yeah. from that we're going down a bad rabbit hole but i'm good man how are you <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. It's been a pretty fast paced summer, um, you know, between uh, uh, between activities with the kids, getting them to all of their stuff. Now they're we're settling in. Uh, Anthony starts his soccer practices this week and he's at, we've, we've, we've all we've all joined a new club. So uh, we didn't get a Here we go from Fabrizio Romano or a or, or a, uh, a Nicolo Shiro, but uh we made a we we switched clubs here uh, in the Milwaukee area. So, um, uh, but uh, it was an it was under the radar and under the noses of the likes of Romano and Shira. So cool. Uh, but right. uh, uh, other than that, yeah, just uh, got to go up north. Got to do some camping. Uh, got to do some. Got to do a lot of golf. Uh, you know, my son's playing now, so I just take him and. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, very busy, but uh, you know, can't get them back to school fast enough. I'm sure you're feeling the same way. Amen, amen. Yeah, it's been so busy. I haven't, I haven't had any time to cut my hair yet. My hair is just growing like crazy. So uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> and uh, you know, the hard thing too is we're so busy in our in our personal lives, and then city ah has just been, I mean, gunfire this summer, one thing after another. I mean, even today, some breaking news happened, right? So it's just. So many things to get into. We need, we can't do it all by ourselves, can we? No, we needed some help, man. We needed some help, and uh, fortunately, we did get some help uh, to do this podcast. Um, I mean, Serie A. I'll tell you what, and we're going to talk about this on this side of the pond. Serie A is going to have a lot more eyes on it, um, mainly because of I shall call it an American invasion on the peninsula. Uh, got a couple of Americans now at Milan. We've got a couple at Juventus. We now have uh, Cade Cowell going to Bologna, uh, which is another intriguing signing. So the Americans are starting to turn up um, in Italy, uh, which will which will make it even more intriguing. But yeah, we did get help. We wanted to not only make sure we got help, but we got someone uh, to help speak on the perspective of the defending champions, they yeah. they are going to be wearing that Scudetto on their jerseys for the first time in 33 years. He's the producer and host of the Forts and Napoli pod, founder of Forts and Napoli Press. Uh, and he is back for, I believe, is this number five, cap number five? Uh, Joseph uh, Fischetti. Joe, great to have you back with us. How are you? Thanks, guys. Yeah, I, I don't remember how many caps oh, now, but th that's a good thing, right? It's yeah. I, I now consider myself a sort of semi regular. Right? <laughs> there you go. There you go. You guys, eight seasons is honestly, as someone who yeah. produces a show, I know what a, uh, an amazing amount of work that is. So, congrats to you guys on that. Cheers. So, this is our 270th podcast. Um, we'll and hit 300 this year. We're going to hit three. I mean, you got to figure with 38 match weeks, we're going to hit 300 this year. So, um, you know, so that's uh, so that's that's on the books, and that's something for us to to think about. So, um, I'm trying to, it's, it, you know, I'm trying to shake off the rust myself here with podcasting. So, uh, <laughs> well, the big news uh, today, the big news, breaking news today is uh, a certain resignation for the Azzurri, right? Uh, Roberto Mancini, he is gone. Um, uh, what are you guys' thoughts on this? Because obviously, a couple weeks ago, I think. Something that would shock many people, I think, who are tired with Mancini is that he was given all this power for what reason? Because he's done nothing really since you know, the Euros. And then a couple weeks later, today, he resigns. 
what are your guys' thoughts? Joe, you're uh, you're the guest here. What are your initial thoughts on the the sacking or the f- resignation of Roberto Mancini? Yeah, it's kind of crazy. I think nobody saw this one coming, right? Um, it's I've already seen links to the Saudi national team, which may be the reason why it's it's kind of sudden. Because you have to think, like, if this couldn't have been something planned. If it was, you probably would have done it a while ago, not right. – you know, a month before the the Nations League and 10 months before the Euros and qualifying coming up. So surprised. I mean, my immediate reaction, I hate to say it, is I I wonder if this was just a personal decision because, you know, he's lost so many close friends in the last couple of years, right? And and maybe he just wanted to walk away from it for a bit. But then then I saw these Saudi links and that makes me wonder if it was just a financial decision. I, I, you know, if that was the reason, I wish it just happened sooner so they could have found a replacement sooner and, and got in going on the new team. Yeah, yeah, uh, Scott, the 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 glasses are going to probably be a staple here from here on out as I'm getting older. The uh, uh, the vision, especially looking at screens, is getting is getting worse and worse. So, Frank, uh, Father Time is undefeated. Yeah, it is. It beats us all. It beats us all. And, 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 and it's beating the hell out of me. I can show you. I'm going to try to find and see if I can get some nicer ones uh, than this. But uh, anyway, um, uh, here, here's the thing. Um, yeah, I, he's he's following the Saudi money by recent stories that have come out today, uh, you know, as this gets more and more unpacked. Um you know, this is probably the saga of a national team manager that as, as, as for everything that he's done to change the culture of how Italy play, um, he's been here a little too long. OK, and he's been here a little too long, largely because it was a continued uh, loyalty to the guys that won Euro 2020 and the failure to, so to speak, turn the page. Um, and start introducing the younger players, start bringing them in more, start giving them more opportunities. Only when injuries started to mount was when his hand was forced. And you saw a Raspadori out there, or you saw a Retegi out there, uh, Ginonto, uh, and, and players of that ilk. Um, you know, but he remained to, for whatever reason, Bonucci kept making the Italy team, even though he's way past it as a defender. Uh, some of the decisions are heads, the decisions were head scratching, despite the fact that there were younger players ready to step in and take the responsibility. So him getting out of the way now uh, is probably a win for the national team. Um, and uh, excitement to see what's going to happen next. Uh, and it's an opportunity now for those younger national team players to hop to hopefully have the chance, uh, you know, to work their way into it. I just it 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 was the same thing over and over. And I think the performances got predictable. The continued faith in Jorginho, uh, you know, sitting in that role in the four three three, where he, I mean, he they just England just ran past him um, like he was in cement boots, uh, you know, in the uh, in the recent Euro qualifier. Uh, so time to move on. Uh, you know, Mancini bowing out gracefully was probably the best result Italy could have hoped for because my gut would have told me he carries on. Italy goes through a couple more qualifiers here in September or whatever they got coming up. It's still underwhelming and the seat gets even hotter. So um, I heard some people saying, yeah, this is a little bit too late. This should have been done after the World Cup. I just don't know how you can sack a manager one year, okay, fine, they failed to qualify for the World Cup, but one year after they won the Euros, okay? Um, And at that time, I don't know how much blame I could really put on Mancini because they lost to a North Macedonia team in that qualifying playoff despite having 32 shots in that game. In which of which I think fourteen or fifteen were on target. I, you know, I, I haven't been bothered to go back and take a look at it. You know, sometimes you got to look at it and say, you know, hey, the lineup was right. Everything was, they didn't score. So, um, but I, th- th- this is a good opportunity for the Italy national team. Clean break and uh, a great situation for the moving ahead. Um, as 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 much joy as as Mancini has given us. I think this was long overdue and looking at the results under Mancini, no, no doubt about it. Mancini's probably the best looking manager we've ever had in our, in our history, right? Best dress, you know, Italian, classic Italian, but you, you look at his whole scope of work in terms of the Azzurri, 
And it's starting to look like the Azzurri, I mean, excuse me, Euro 2020, maybe just a flash in the pan. Everything hit right. You had Spinazzola playing fantastic, Chiesa. I mean, you had these fantastic performances left and right. Donnarumma coming up huge in the penalties. Ever since then, outside of that tournament, what has they, what have they done? They're, you mentioned about inconsistency. I think they've been consistently not winning. Draws mm-hmm. or losses, not very few wins. Do you seen the as you call, as you said with Manucci, the stale stale rotation of the players, not really bringing the new blood. They I, I added here a piece here and a piece there. Reti Gui was one of the guys, but he was too stubborn and we didn't want to change things. And I get it. We saw this with Lippy. We've seen this with many other managers in the past where they, they want something with a, with a team and they, they feel almost like they're betraying them by taking them out and then they keep the same, using the same players over and over again and it doesn't work. So I think this was uh, – I'm glad he, this happened. You know, I'm happy for what he did for the Azuri, but it was time for him to go. And the thing that sucks about all of this is they wait, what, eight days before the first game of the season so that any manager that really wanted to come is too late now because they're already invested into the season, you know, to start coming up here next week. Who do you have available? The two available op- options right now is one of Joe's old boys, Spalletti. Spalletti's not with a job, and Conte. Uh, people want to say maybe hey, we should go with Conte because you know he did very well for us in the past. But again, as someone mentioned, I see someone put it on Twitter or, or Instagram or somewhere said we had this really poor run of bringing back old managers and to no avail, not not good, you know, not good success rate. And so, if Spalletti wanted it. I don't see why you wouldn't go for him, honestly. I mean, I don't know what other options are available in terms of Italian managers. Maybe you could go outside and think outside of Italian managers, but I doubt that will happen. But uh, it's uh, it's for the better, and I'm glad to see him gone. But uh, the team needs a new refresh. And again, I'm thinking that Euro 2020 was more a flash in the pan than anything else. Uh, let me jump in here real quick. My, my, my vote against Conte is really, really simple. I just don't think the current player pool – is conducive to what Conte wants tactically. Um, three at the back, uh, you know, work rate guys and things like that. Mind you, Conte got Italy to the quarterfinals of Euro 2016 with one of the worst Italy rosters I've ever seen. Um, but I, I'm pro Spalletti, as I think just about anybody who is going to host a Serie A or Italian football podcast is. He's, you know, he 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 went back to making wine in Tuscany and. Uh, he could still make wine in Tuscany and manage the national team. It's, you know, certainly you got to go around and, uh, you know, evaluate talent and you've got that portion of your responsibility. But I mean, how much, you know, the, it's not a week to week grind as it, as it is in coaching a club team. Uh, I'm assuming Joe, you're on board with, with Spalletti hopefully being the next boss as well. Oh, absolutely. I'd, I'd love to see it, uh, you know, to your point, Frank, about, uh, the personnel and also the the system and and back to what I mentioned earlier because there's such a short time before the Euros, I'd rather have someone that's going to come in and play the same system that Mancini was already playing. The players are pretty exactly. familiar with the setup than a more drastic change with Conte. The only thing that might be a little wrinkle in this, and, and you know, being a Napoli fan, I this news is a bit closer to me. But uh, De Laurentiis, I think, had some sort of release clause or there was because if you recall Spalletti still had one year left in his contract so they had to negotiate for him to take a season off um, and I, I suspect there's some financial mechanism in there that would need to be triggered to allow Spalletti to take the job so that might be something to keep an eye on but just in terms of system and style of play and sort of the attractiveness of Spalletti's football who doesn't want to see that with the national team right Exactly. Yeah. And I wonder if that even, uh, you know, that's a good point you brought about the about the clauses in their contracts. I wonder if that applies for national teams because they're not in the league. It wouldn't be, I mean, you'd be using other, your players and stuff like it from everybody on the team in the league. But uh, that's curious. I'm curious, you yeah. know, someone who's more familiar with contracts, you know, does it apply to national teams or does it not? You know, that's, that's something to know because I don't know the answer to that. Sure. Interesting days ahead uh, for the Azzurri. Um, You know, hopefully they come to their consensus and they come to the consensus that Spalletti is the guy. Hopefully Spalletti is interested in it. We'll see, you know, what the fallout is here over the next couple of days, handful of days, whatever. Um, so let's move back to the clubs here. And I think what we'll do is we'll start with you, Joe, and we'll start talking about Napoli. They're the defending champions. There's Michael Lisi. How are you, Michael? We've got our resident referee in the uh, in the building, so that's good. Um, but okay, so uh, won the title running away. Um, 
you lose Minjai, you lose Zielinski. Uh, so, and uh, you, you lose Spalletti and in comes Rudy Garcia. Um, Quadratalia is back, obviously. Ossiman looks like he's going to sign a, a long-term contract um, after uh, thwarting off efforts by those, mainly the Saudis, um, uh, for his services. Uh, what's the confidence level of the Napoli supporter right now uh, in terms of their efforts to try to repeat as Scudetto winners with everything factored in? Because last year we looked at the departures of a lot of veteran players and thought, okay, this was going to take a while. And it didn't take a while. They came out flying and they, and they stayed there. So what's the, what's the confidence level? What's kind of the mood right now, you know, of the, uh, of the Napoli fan base coming into this season? I'd say most Napoli fans are, are still fairly confident. I mean, the, the big question mark, obviously, is going to be how does Rudy Garcia compare to Spalletti, right? Yeah. Spalletti, even in his first season, didn't win the Scudetto. He, he got them back into the Champions League and won it in his second season. I think what most Napoli fans are looking at is Napoli won the league by 16 points, right? And even if you weaken the team by replacing Kim with a relative unknown out of Brazil and Natan, um, and with the potential departure of Zielinski, although it seems like uh, Gabri Vega is very, very close to signing, so that would be a very, very good replacement for Zielinski. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, did Napoli's team weaken enough, and did the others, who I'm sure we'll get to, improve enough to, to make this a competitive league. I think it'll definitely be way more competitive than last season. And from what I've seen with Garcia in training, a lot of his his training methods, his system, are pretty similar to Spalletti's. You're going to see it a different style a little bit. Garcia tends to be much more direct, so we're going to see a lot more uh, long balls, which is fine when you have a player like Osiman. You're going to see a lot more counterattacking, very fast counterattacks. Um, so, so far, Napoli fans are feeling pretty good. But those, you know, there's you can't replace a player like him. There, that player doesn't exist, right? I mean, one of the best center backs in the world, best in Serie A last season, and and then Spalletti. So yeah, feeling good, but it's definitely going to be more competitive for sure. Uh, what's interesting is uh, well, we you know a little plug for ourselves, but we did a uh, breakdown of uh, Rudy Garcia and his tactics. It's on our YouTube page homepage, so check that out if you haven't. But you know, in terms of player personnel, you know, as of right now, no really big moves have happened outside of Min J. Kim. We'll see Zelensky if that comes to fruition and OC money does, in fact, stay. But the personnel pretty much stays the same. I think the big change for you guys, obviously, is the, which is the, the low hanging fruit, is Spalletti out, Rudy Garcia in. Similar tactics, uh, as you mentioned, uh, as we described as well. But there is a big difference mentality wise. Rudy Garcia really hasn't done, he's been close, he's done really well everywhere he's played. But this is like a team that is clicking on all cylinders last season, outperformed everybody. Mentality wise, they're up there. But now you got a new man in the fold. Are you worried at all that, you know, yes, while the personnel stays the same, formation still the same, tactics are fairly the same. Coming in when the when the time when it's needed, when you know, last year Solati was able to come in, calm the guys and take the deflection off of them to him. Does Rudy Garcia have that when the when there's crunch time there? Will he be able to fend off you know, the outside eyes and will he keep them focused the entire season? Because Spalletti, you know, you got to give him credit. He did it the entire season, which nobody thought was going to happen. Uh, so kudos to Spalletti. But that's my question to you. What do you think about Rudy Garcia's uh, – can he really help this team continue on, build upon what happened last year? Yeah, I think because the personnel is largely the same, and I think, you know, sometimes – with the Mercato, the best transfers you make are the ones that you don't make, right? Or the best transfers are the ones you don't make. So to me, the key was keeping Cavada, keeping Osimen. There's still a possibility that even if Gabri Vega comes in, that Zielinski stays is, you know, the latest reports were that his wife kind of decided they don't want the family to move to Saudi. And which is, a, I think, a common reason for players to decline like the insane money. It's the only reason I've seen that <laughs> a lot of people, uh, you know, Messi kind of did a similar thing. But with Garcia, it's funny because I think most Napoli fans are looking at this and saying, well, most of it is the same. Yes, he hasn't really won anything major, at least not in a long time, like since he won Liga way yeah. back. Um, but also acknowledging that there were a lot of the same comments made about Spalletti when he was hired, right? And Correct. He was always kind of the bridesmaid and never the bride, and then he did it, so why not Rudy Garcia? 
And then everyone outside of Napoli, fans of other clubs are all looking at it and saying, this is an insane hiring. This guy is not the level of coach that Napoli need to have. So I see both sides of the argument. Um, I, I still think he can do it. But I mean, at the end of the day, like it's been 33 years since Napoli won the Scudetto. So, you know, it's, it's a lot to ask for to win it two years in a row. We certainly don't want it to take another 33 years. <laughs> but, <laughs> with all the competition, like, you know, we'll get to predictions, I'm sure, but I, I, it's so up in the air for me. I'm, I'm still struggling right now trying to think of how I rank, you know, the top six because yeah. it's, it's, there's been so much change, maybe not so much at Napoli, but everywhere else, you know, I don't. I honestly don't know what to what to expect. <laughs> uh, touch on the new arrivals here for me. Uh, uh, currently, that uh, that are in uh, Jens Kajust, Nathan, um, are, are are pretty much the two, and then you got Gabri Vega coming over from uh, uh, Celta. Is that looks like it's going to get wrapped up? I, I I saw some tape on Kajust. I'm pretty impressed. Feels like a guy that you know you're going to probably. Uh, rotate with Angisa. Um, you know, at least it's the impression that I get just watching his positional play, his awareness, and things like that. Uh, Knighton, I'm not particularly versed with yet. Um, and then Vega, I, I've got a little bit of familiarity with. But talk about the new players and uh, the impact that you hope, or not hope, but the impact that you think is reasonable for them to make on this team. Sure. So you're spot on with Cayusta. Uh, He's the exact profile of Angisa. Um, what what Garcia said actually is that they feel he can play in any of those three midfield positions, whether it's as a, an attacking midfielder, whether it's a holding, uh, you know, playmaker midfield, the box to box. He can fill any of those roles. But his profile is very similar to Angisa, which is really important because there wasn't really a backup to Angisa last season, and we know that he's going to be heading to potentially going to um, the Africa Cup of Nations. If if Cameroon qualify, they have to get at least a draw yeah. in their final match. He has an injury at the moment, so he may not even be in the squad at the beginning. He should return for maybe the second match of the season, I would expect. So it's important to have a player like that. And so far, all we've seen from him is, you know, a 25-minute appearance in a friendly. So take that with a grain of salt. But he did look very good in that appearance. So... There's, I think that's a positive sort of depth signing. I think Napoli could still use more depth in the midfield, to be perfectly honest. Most Napoli fans were hoping Diego Demet would be shipped out and someone else like <laughs> as would be brought in. But uh, it seems like Garcia wants more physical players, so he didn't meet that profile. Nathan, I only know a little bit about him because I spoke to a, a Brazilian football expert. Um, from what I can tell, he's, he's not going to be Kim. Um, he has some of those characteristics. He, he's super aggressive. Uh, he has pace. He's big. He's good in the air. Uh, but he's not as polished. He's he's definitely more raw than Kim was. So, you know, while he likes to carry the ball, he's probably going to be a bit clunky on the ball, like a, what you would expect from a traditional center back as opposed to the more modern ones that are ball carriers. He can distribute the ball fairly well, but again, not not quite as polished as Kim. So for me, that's that's a clear downgrade. And I would expect uh, that Juan Jesus, is, as much as we criticize him, he's actually been pretty good for Napoli when they needed him to. So I think they'll rely on him at the beginning of the season because the one criticism I have, I don't mind Napoli uh, not making a ton of moves in the Mercado because we kept a lot of our key pieces. Yeah. The one criticism I do have is that they waited a long time. I mean, we were linked to just mm -hmm. like every single center back you can think of. There was literally 30 or 40 names that at some point or another we were we were linked to. And so because we brought these guys in so late in the market, there's not a whole lot of time for them to learn the system and adjust and get ready for the start of the season. So I think um, I think that Juan Jesus will probably start with Rachmani or maybe even Ostegard at the start of the season. And... Uh, and that's fine because, you know, we'll see, uh, you know, and just, just to reply to, to Dino there in the comments, just keep in mind, Cayuse is our backup midfielder, right? So, yeah, that's great if he's not the starter of the uh, in the Swedish national team, but we're not looking for him to be, you know, the top player on the team either. Yeah, depth is uh, not certainly not a bad thing, but it's also good to keep some of the, the veterans, right? And uh, Dino, speaking of him, he says uh, he read some articles that Ossiman will sign a new contract, which we all saw, uh, 10 million net salary with 150 million release clause. Uh, from what you know, is that correct? Or is that around the same, the right 
ball figure? It's right in that ballpark. Now, today now they're saying that possibly even 12 million euros in that a season. And the way you have to look at the Osman signing is is like this. So he currently has two years left in his contract. Napoli were offered, or De Laurentiis was looking for something like 200 million, and only a Saudi club is going to offer that. Uh, Al Hilal apparently came very close, and they were offering him 40 million euros net in salary, which is just out of this world. Wow. Uh, so I think what will happen is if they agree to this, you know, some people were saying, I was having this conversation with some Napoli fans where they felt like 150 million euro release clause, if he has the same type of season he had last season, you look at for what the transfer fees for some players are these days, like a Jude Bellingham or, or these types of guys, 150 is not that much. And someone will definitely step up and, and offer that. So why not a higher release clause? My response to that is that it's probably because Osiman and his entourage insisted on something in that range because he dreams of playing in the Premier League. So he's not going to want a super high release clause that limits the number of interested parties, right? So if Napoli were to not extend him, and then he's going to leave next summer and that purchase price is going to come down because he only has a year left. So this way you guarantee that 150 million. He still has two years left come the end of this season. I think it's probably good for everyone all around. And then it gives Napoli more time to find the, the right replacement as well. Okay. Last one for me, Joe. Um, we got 20 teams right now that are all on zero points uh, and haven't played a match yet. So they all think they can win the Scudetto. Um, there's one team that's wearing that shield. That's your team. But um, from the cha- based on the changes, based on how the landscape is looking uh, right now, your reasonable expectation <clears throat> for Napoli in the 23-24 season. Honestly, I think they have to be competing for the Scudetto again. Just going back to, to the point I made earlier, when you look at the disparity last season, the, the players are largely unchanged. I think it'll be a lot closer this season because, again, Inter got better. Milan, you know, so much change. We'll see how how Pioli manages that. But you have to think Milan are closer to, to the top, if not at the top this season as well. Juventus competing in only one competition. Like, most of the teams below Napoli got better and, and probably improved by a wider margin than Napoli did. So my expectation is still that they're competing for the Scudetto. It's still that... They're, they're targeting semifinals of the Champions League, which is maybe a bit of a stretch target because, I mean, last year it was more realistic because of the way the draw went, um, but certainly reaching the round of 16. And and yeah, and then Coppa Italia is a, sort of a, I hate to say it, but a nice to have compared to the other two competitions. You say that, uh, you know, Napoli are going to be challenging for Scudetto, and you can arguably say there's four maybe five teams that are going to be saying that this year which is crazy because that's how good this league is this year so but i think what we need what you need is, uh, from that is consistency from the players i think we all can agree that Osiman has shown that he is that consistent player and he's going to continue to be do well the big question mark which was the big question mark for milanisti last year was can did, can can mr mr do it all do it again right last year was leao could he follow up his mvp year with something and he did this time it's Cavara. Can he do it? Can he live up to that, you know, that great, you know, explosion onto the scene last year, and then all of a sudden, second year, everyone knows all your moves now. Can he do the same or better this year? What are your thoughts uh, on Cavada? What you've seen in preseason? You're just your gut instincts. Yeah, no, it's it's a great question, Richard. And uh, what I would say is, I think people's roles, players' roles, are going to change a little bit this season. You know, one thing that a lot of uh, fans have pointed out with Cavada is that he was shut down for the final, say, quarter of last season. Now, for me, I'm not terribly concerned about that because Napoli basically had the Scudetto wrapped up anyways. But what we did see is when you double team him, he's far less effective. So my hope is that Garcia recognizes that and and sets the team up in a way that Cavada becomes more of a playmaker. He's probably going to score fewer goals is my expectation just because of that extra attention on him. He's, he's not, you know, at least at the start of last year, he was an unknown. He's no longer an unknown, but in theory that should create opportunities for other players. And one guy I think could have a bigger season for Napoli this year is Giacomo Raspadori because he's 
Garcia has been experimenting with him as a right winger, as a central midfielder or on the right side of the midfield. <laughs> I think he could be one of these guys that might benefit from Cavada being double, double marked because that means somebody else is open. Right. Um, the other thing that concerns me a little bit to keep an eye on is injuries. Um, with the change in coaching staff, Napoli have had a ton of injuries in the summer, very minor, a lot of these little nagging muscular things. And most people are attributing that to just the change in the training regimen. They went from training one way to another, and mm. it's kind of a wait and see, yeah. but there's been a lot of those. So that could be the type of thing that could just kill your season, as as both of our, our fan bases know, right? Yeah. You get rack up a lot of injuries at the same time. It could really hurt you. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. Um, all right. So that is where we're at, at the state of Napoli, the state of the champions. Uh, it's some good questions, some good answers. Um, <clears throat> I'm with you. I think they're a contender for the title once again. Uh it, my biggest concern is how the new players mesh in, how the defense looks without Kim. Um, those are questions that they're going to have to answer over the first 10 games of the season. If they can, uh, if they can answer those questions, then they're right there yet again. Um, we shall, we shall see how that, uh, how that plays out. Uh, you know, we talked about transfers with Napoli. I mean, let's, let's now just jump into um, our season preview um, and we're going to start with the Mercato. Uh, obviously we need, you know, what we need to start with is that uh, there's, we're always going to lose players. City is always going to lose players. Um, uh, Tonali gone to Newcastle and already dominating the Premier League on his first game. Um, <clears throat> Sergei Milinkovic Savic off to Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, players that have departed, um, but what I'll say here is, you know, and, and I think it's going to unveil itself here over the course of the Serie A season, <clears throat> most of our clubs in this league have gotten much smarter at scouting, have gotten much smarter at having, let's call it, short lists of players that they want to make sure that they <clears throat> track and say, hey, when we end up selling this guy, let's think about these three to four players and then just try to figure out their value and, and who makes, who makes sense to come in based on the way we play. Um, I think that is most evident in how Italian teams performed in Europe last year. Okay. Respective to other teams. Now, premier league teams are going to be much stronger this year because of their spending power. Um, you know, but there's only so many limited premier league teams that get to play in these European competitions. So there's opportunities for the Serie A teams, Bundesliga teams, the La Liga teams to, to advance deep into competition. So I don't think that we'll see anything to the tune of what we saw this this past season where what do we have? We had, I think, we had three finalists uh, in each of, the, each of the major European Cups. But our, I uh, let's start with this question. Does the transfer activity, does the, uh, does the activity of the teams here in the Mercato um, have you more optimistic or more pessimistic about the quality that we're going to see in Serie A this season? I'm going to say optimistic. Okay, it's inevitable that you're going to be parting with really good players for you know at certain times that richer clubs are just going to come in and get them. And as I said, I think the clubs are doing a better job with scouting departments and with identifying the talent that okay, this guy plugs right in and, and off we go again. Uh, Joe, are you more optimistic or more pessimistic based on uh, some of the uh, changes with these teams this year? Yeah, no, I'm optimistic as well. Um, I think it's exciting that there's going to be these names that we might have seen players occasionally when we played them in Europe uh, but haven't watched regularly. And there's been so many of these players coming in that at least a couple of them are bound – to, to you know hit the mark right so I think it's exciting and even if you know relative to the the Premier League the quality is lower in Serie A I think as the competition across the league is going to be very high if that makes sense so mm -hmm. you know there's more parity basically and and that just makes for entertaining exciting football so no I'm I'm optimistic about it um and I completely agree I, I think the financial situation of the league and a lot of the clubs which was exasperated by the, the whole pandemic 
uh, has forced clubs to be a lot smarter in their scouting and, and a lot less wasteful um, right to the, the big three teams, right? You're seeing it, you know, with, with the business that Milan did with selling Tonali and, and spending a little bit more, but, you know, the amount of depth that Milan have added to that squad, even at a European level, I think it helps, right? Because now you have way more players that you can fill in different positions. So you're not playing the exact same team, you know, three, every three days or whatever. Uh, and, and even up to guys like the, the clubs like Juventus that now are, are also uh, focusing more on youth and, you know, they, they got rid of Cuadrado, for example, 35 years old or 34, whatever it is. It, bringing in Juntoli, is, I think, is a clear indication that they want to focus on on building a club in that way. Um, and for me, it's I'm optimistic and I'm excited. How about you, Richard? Uh, you know, it, obviously it's sad to see players go to, like, the Saudi League or, you know, be sold. Obviously, we have... We have an interest in, you know, Tonali and, and his departure, but I think I'm op- optimistic overall. I think what we saw last year at the end, especially the new boys that came into the league, they were well versed in, in how to scout properly. And, and as a result, two teams got to survive. And I think this year as well, some of the new boys that come in, we have a good potential of one, maybe two teams surviving, if not three, you know, the way these teams are built. And so scouting comes is a huge role now in how these teams develop. You're not always going to have the money. Yeah, sure, Milan had the money this year, but you know sometimes maybe Juventus or, or Napoli or Inter may have the money. But for the most part, you're going to have to scout, and you have to earn a, earn it that way. Look what Atalanta has been doing for several years now, right? You you build these players from nothing and then sell them off and just keep rebuilding the cycle. And that keeps you going, and that's what, kind of what some of these uh, these owners are looking for. And so I'm very optimistic, and I think the uh, as you guys have mentioned, the league continues every year to get stronger and stronger. You know, outside of Napoli when the Scudetto last year. It was a really close league for you know from the maybe two to two to ten, and so this year I, f- I foresee the top ten gonna be very close again. And it's just it just uh goes back to what Joe said is that this is you know the parity in the league is, is tremendous and to you know that's so why you gotta give kudos to Spalletti last year because Napoli brought it every week. In this league, you have to bring it every week. There's so many good teams. You're gonna get found out. Found out. You know, there's teams like Monza. There's teams like Bologna. Who, yeah, they may be mid table. They can take your day. They take your number anytime. So, you're gonna expect these teams to play a lot better more often. That'll serve them in the tournaments as well. Because when they go and play these tournaments, the big thing about you know the European teams and the Spanish teams when they go to Europe is that they have that competition in their leagues. And so when they go to Europe, they're used to that experience, and then they are able to apply it to the to against these teams that don't have the the parity in the league as as they do. So. You'll see Italy be much more involved now and, and, and hopefully go deeper and deeper tournaments. Three teams in the finals last year. Hopefully that's just the tip of the iceberg. And this year we see you know uh, several more deep runs in all three competitions. So we'll see. But I'm excited. Yeah, it's 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 going to be great. I mean, I think that when you take a look at uh, what some of these teams have done, I mean, Napoli have just have, have addressed some positions, you know, to where uh, just going down this list, Napoli have addressed some positions where, and we've kind of talked about this, you know, these arrivals are probably not as certain as the previous ones. So, you know, maybe a little bit more to be determined. Um, you know, I, I like what Lazio have done so far, uh, even though they lost Milinkovic Savic to get Kamada on a free after he was for the longest time going to go to Milan. Uh, and then the management change and changes happening there. Um, I love the Gustav Isaksen signing for them. I think he's ideal as a winger, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to flank someone like Chiro Immobile. Um, and then I know that there was talk that they could be pulling in both Rovella and Pellegrini from Juventus. That hasn't happened yet. Um, but Pellegrini gives them that fullback that I think is still a position of need uh, for Lazio going into the season. Um, so, and then a couple of other examples. I mean, you know, Inter, uh, you know, snatching Turan for free, uh, getting Davide Fratesi, who had been kind of the, the, the prize midfielder for quite some time uh, for many clubs, uh, not just here in Italy. Uh, so they did some work. And then obviously what Milan has done, um, you know, with the Tonali sale, reinvesting that and going to get a few players. I mean, we, there's there's going to be the talk about Pulisic and Chukwese and Okafor and what those guys can do. Um, the guy, and if you go and go a little further back in my Twitter feed, you will find a thread I did on Tiani Reinders, who I think – might end up being the best signing out of all of them um, with the role that he's going to play in in what appears to be a 4-3-3 that Pioli's setting out to do to be able to link the defense and the and the attack. Um, I, 
great vision, sees things ahead of, uh, ahead of everybody. It seems, um, won't take the unnecessary risks with the ball will help his team keep it. Um, a little bit with his defending that I think needs to get better, uh, but we're, we, we're, we're other, where's a better place to go than Italy to get better at defending. Right. Um, so, uh, and then Roma, um, the business that they're doing, I think that getting Evan and Dika on a free, a guy that, that fits the profile of a three man for a three man defense. Alwar is a midfielder with his energy. Um, and then uh, the Renato Sanchez thing is off and on and off and then on again. Uh, but now I'm seeing that Leandro Paredes might be coming uh, and that Duvan Zapata might be coming as well. Um, you know, Zapata would certainly be happy to stay in Italy, go to another club and show uh, show the other clubs that he's still got something left in him. And the physicality of him, it feels like a good type of profile striker that Mourinho wants. So... Um, all the clubs uh, at the top have have done well, and but I think the guy that I'm going to be most intrigued by, we got our wish, Richard Mbala and Zola going to Fiorentina. Um, yeah. We wanted to see him with a better club to see the kind of damage that he can do, and if he and it looks like they brought in Beltron from River Plate, so it looks like it's going to be a tug of war between those guys for the striker position at Fiorentina. But if Enzola cements his place, there's 18 to 20 goal upside with him with the quality that he has around him. So the the rich got richer in terms of quality, in terms of depth. Um, but uh, I'll ask you guys. I ran off a bunch of names that I was, you know, as far as signings that I was impressed with. And Richard, we'll go first with you. Give me some signings. Uh, give me two or three signings that you're really impressed with that you're looking forward to seeing that you expect uh, will will do quite well and will be able to to hit the ground running. Well, first let me say this: that you know, going back to last season when Maldini was sacked, and and then I said I said then that my confidence went from fifty percent to zero percent with Cardinale. Yeah, where are you at now? <laughs> yeah, and I said I wanted to see. I would give him the summer mercato to see what their what their intentions were, and then they sold Tonali right away, like immediately after that. But the moves that they've made, the Milan has made, um, including getting rid of some dead weight, right? Rebic to Basikta, Tatsurasan, who's out. Ibrahimic is retired. Um, I think I met you know the one piece that I, I wasn't happy to see go, but for the grand part of thing, it must think it makes sense. CDK, you know, he's going to Atalanta. I'm at a 70% right now. I, from, I went from zero to 70 based on the moves that happened this summer and what they've done. I mean, I've been very impressed by the Milan management, uh, everyone in the back room, back staff this summer. Now, we want to see how it looks on the pitch, right? That's another story. But I'm back up to 70%. I think what they've done is they invested very well. Um, and, you know, and of, the, of all those all those signings, uh, Chukwese and, and Luca Romero, the guys who really, you know, bring my attention on that, on that team, Inter... They, you know, they lost Onana. That's a huge loss. However, Jan Sommer is a fantastic goalkeeper. He has been for a veteran. long time. Mm -hmm. He's a veteran. And they got Aldero as a good backup. They got rid of Handanovic. They got rid of some dead weight. So Inter are, are really looking strong. You know, Sassuolo, it seems like they finally got the hint that Consigli, as good as he's been, he may not have any more left in him. And they brought in Cranio to kind of fight fight over that position. And Cranio has been a keeper that we've kind of all liked for a long time. He's been a solid, a solid guy. But... Of all the moves I think that happened this year, I mean, I'm going to be looking at Retegui at Genoa. Can he perform in the Serie A? He's done well with the Azuri, the brief time that he's been there, but can what can he do in Serie A? Uh, that's going to be one I'm really looking at. Um, I want to see the moves that... Really, I want to see the new boys, Genoa and, and Cagliari. Can the moves that they made... I like the moves that they made. Yankto, Yankto is going to Cagliari, uh, as is Shomordorov, uh, Augello, and Scufet. Nice, all nice signings. And then Genoa, obviously, with the Thorsby. Uh, they got Messias and, uh, and Retegui. So I want to see what they can do. But um, outside of that, honestly, Skamaka is going to be the one name I'm going to really look at. They lost Hoyland. Hoyland is a guy who had a, uh, a meteoric rise last season and, and really an international as well. But Skamaka, a guy who kind of was up here for all of us and then went to West Ham and dropped all the way back down. Can he resurrect his career at Atalanta? That's a great place to do it. You're gonna have it's a system that should lead to lots of opportunities. We'll see with Muriel and Zapata there, like how that's gonna work. But I think he's in a really good place to develop. So that's the guy I'm gonna be really focusing on this year to see like what can he do for the striker position for the Azzurri because you know right now it's red degree, but it's really up in the air. Like who's gonna do it? Immobile is kind of out of the picture as is Belotti. So what can who's gonna bring? Who's gonna step up? That's gonna be my question. 
Rotegi already with two goals in his Coppa Italia game here for Genoa. Yeah. So he's off to a good start. So we'll yeah. see. You know, we'll see how that goes. And yeah, I, you mentioned Skamaka. I, I think a guy that I think low-key is going to be really good signing for Atalanta as well as Mitchell Bakker. Um, I think he's the he's an ideal wing back. You know a little bit more about him from his time in uh, Bundesliga. I think he played in Bundesliga last year. Um, so uh, so that's another one. I think Atalanta have done some really good business in this window. And I, keeping Cup Miners uh, above all of that has probably been their their biggest move to date. So, so far, so uh, far. Yep. Joe, across the landscape in Serie A, give me uh, two or three uh, new signings that you think are going to do really well that you're looking forward to see. For sure. So, yeah, I mean, I agree with a lot of what you guys said. So I'll give you some some additional names. Uh, one is uh, Castellanos at, at Lazio. Yeah. I think. Hey, yeah. You know, I watched him not as much with New York City FC, but at Girona, and he was fantastic there. And I think with Immobile getting older and more injury prone, which we saw last season, this is finally the backup striker that Lazio fans have been waiting for, right? Good so goal rate too, right? Like one goal in yeah. two games or something like yeah, that. Yeah, he scores. He is a pure goal scorer. My concern with Lazio, though, is I as much as I love the signings, Isaacson, Kamada, great players, I just still feel like they don't have enough depth considering they will be playing in the Champions League this year, right, as opposed yeah. to Europa League. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, I really like the Castellano signing. Um, I'll, I'll mention a couple names that are not yet Inter players, but – you know, may or may not be. The the stories are changing. Uh, Samrzic was one heavily linked. It seemed like yeah. it was a done deal, and now lately there's been reports that there's some something going on with his agent or his yeah. father. It seems like, yeah, the yeah. player wants the deal to happen, but maybe not so much his entourage. They might be getting a little bit greedy there. And we saw how Inter kind of changed their position on Lukaku. So we'll see if, if they keep pushing for uh, Samrzic. Um, and because of that Lukaku situation... Inter are still in the market for a striker. So whether that's Taremi or Balogun, I think those can both be really important players uh, for Inter. Um, I also think, uh, you know, a guy that is is not going to be a huge, hugely important player for Milan, but it's a signing I really like is Marco Sportiello because yeah. uh, the last couple of seasons, we saw Magnon miss time with injury. And, I mean, Tatura Sanu, credit to him, he did a good job playing as a backup, but I, I feel a bit more confident in Sportiello as the backup uh, than, I mean, you guys can tell me if I'm crazy for saying it because on really but I think it's a decent <laughs> signing. Um, mm-hmm. And then uh, a couple more. At Atalanta, I think El Bilal Toure is a, is a nice signing as well. If, you know, Skamaka had a pretty serious knee injury last year, so... We'll see how how he mm-hmm. returns from that. So having Toure, I think, is is a very useful player. Who knows? Maybe he could be one of those breakout players like Lookman was for them last year. And then uh, Frank, you mentioned a couple of Fiorentina signings. I think they've quietly had an amazing summer. I mean, mm-hmm. in addition mm-hmm. in addition to uh, the players that you mentioned, Yeri Mina from Everton is a is a. I mean, <laughs> he's he's the type of player that. You love when he's on your team and you hate him when he's not because he's going to get under people's skin. But I think he could be really good for them at the back. And yeah. the one that if I might put this at the top of the list, in spite of all these amazing names that we've listed off, Fabiano Parisi from Empoli. Yeah, yeah. He was a guy that we all thought was going to end up in a bigger club and somehow Fiorentina swooped in and got him. So yeah. They got Bonazzoli too as well. Yeah, so great, great market for Fiorentina. Yep, agreed. Uh, one player that left... Um, but might be coming back. Uh, <laughs> Romelu Lukaku. Um, you know, we're already seeing uh, as an int- I really love Lukaku, but he really threw me over with his attitude over the past several months. Uh, if he does end up at Juventus, it burns. I know that there was discussion that there was a, you know, there was a, a there was talk about a swap where Vlaovic goes to Chelsea, uh, for Lukaku and like 30 or 40 million. Um, but I think that got that got uh, poo pooed because I think Vlaovic doesn't want to go to Chelsea. Um, was the reports that I was reading? Um, I think it was also yeah. that uh, Chelsea didn't want to pay that much. They were they were in the like twenty million plus Lukaku range, whereas you were looking for forty plus. That. Yep, I mean, and it's 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 leaving Inter kind of holding the bag here because they thought they could work out something to bring back Lukaku permanently. That never happened. Then there's this swap idea with Juventus, and all the while Inter are trying to sign a forward, <laughs> and and they can't because it's whether it's a money thing or whether it's the player's desire or a combination of all of it, they can't they can't get a striker to pair with with Lautaro Martinez, and it's just like, um, you know, I mean, it's you. 
you know, why wouldn't some of these guys that they're talking about, like uh, you know, Balagoon, uh, Taremi, uh, and now it's going to be Arnautovic, who this could this could work out for Inter. Uh, if Arnautovic can get back to health and kind of be the guy that absorbs the pressure and is the target for, for Lataro Martinez to have the freedom and play the style that he plays. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it would not be uh, too much of a departure from the old Lataro Jekyll combination that was going on there for a while. For a while, probably, you know, certainly not as dynamic as Lukaku, but let's come to Lukaku and everything. There's even a couple of Milan Twitter guys that were saying that he might come to Milan. Um, it's so just, this whole, Richard, it's a mess. This whole timeline is an absurd with Lukaku, right? First, he leaves Man United, joins Inter, has a fantastic year, wins the Scudetto. He confesses his love for Inter, and then he goes, hey, I want a Chelsea. Peace. Right? And then at Chelsea, he sucks. Then says, you know, I really wanted to go back to this whole time. So he goes back yeah. to Inter, confesses his love. He's there. And then now, while Inter trying to, you know, resign her or, or sign him, he's dealing with Juventus in the background. And then Zanetti's like, oh, wait, what, what are you doing? Excuse me? With our arch rivals? Get the fuck out of here. You're out. You're gone. <laughs> right. Which is smart. That's what he should be doing. You got to sit. You got to have some kind of, you know, common decency with, with, with all these teams. But then now the rumor is that maybe he goes to Milan. I mean, there's, there was a before that, before, um, before that, in the middle of there, it was, you know, you said Vlahovic for Lukaku and all the Juventus fans protested because they don't want Lukaku. Nobody wants Lukaku. Why Why would Milan fans want him? And and Kus, uh, Kush, who you should go watch his video on him, it makes a compelling argument. I don't want Lukaku. I don't. And for the same reason, everybody else doesn't want him. And he's just a headache. Maybe if he provides, as you know, as Kush mentioned in his video, one good year where he's motivated, wants to like this, say screw you to everyone and has a fantastic maybe 20 goals, I, I can see that working. But man, what a headache this guy brings. And I would be more, as a Milan fan, more, co more concentrating on finding someone who can back up and eventually take the place of Giroud. Maybe that's Okafor. But Lukaku's not it, man. He's not it. Well, I'm tired of seeing all these older guys who just can't cut anymore come back to Milan. And I don't, as much as I hate Inter and Juve, I don't want to take one of their guys to spite them. Like, screw that. Beat them, beat them on the pitch, not but taking their guys. Like, I don't know. You don't want a Mr. X like uh, Fernando Torres anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, and, I, and I don't blame you. Uh, I don't either. I, yeah. So, do, so, so um, but yeah, no more I, Lululemon I, to enter anymore. So, <laughs> I mean, and just the, the dynamic of the ch dressing room where you go from a, a, yes. a, you know, Ibrahimovic, who was revered as a leader now to Lukaku, who, you know, could be a ticking time bomb in there. So, it's, there's, there's no, there's reasons to, there's all the reasons not to do it. So, um, you know, and then there's just his, his some of the brutal things that he did in the Champions League final, playing goalkeeper for Manchester City. So um, that's that's also something that you've got to <laughs> that you've got to put up with as well. You know, you know when he's out there, whose side is he really on, right? Yeah. So um, okay, so let's let's whip through this quickly. I want to be sensitive to we want to be sensitive to Joe's time here. Um, so we've kind of digested all the transfers here. Um, you know, at least. At least a lot of the ones of note. Uh, Richard brought up some of the newly promoted teams, some of the things that they're doing. We need to get to the sack race. Um, you know, there's not a lot of new managers here. Garcia at, at Napoli, and I believe there might be one other. Um, EDF you know, with a club. EDF at Frosinone. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think it's pretty cut and dry who we all think gets sacked first. Just on reputation, but I'm going to go ahead and let you guys, this is going to be a quick one. Uh, so Joe, who gets, who's going to get the sack first? Yeah, it, it's Di Francesco for me. Just, I mean, I couldn't believe unless it was Grosso's decision, but he did so well last season, dominated the league with Frozen on get promoted and then gets replaced. So I, I forgive me. I don't know the background on the story, but yeah, Eusebio De Francesco is definitely my choice for first sacking. Yeah, I I remember I remember here when it happened, but it's been such a long summer. I just it's it's gone and escaped me. So if you know, let us know in the chat or tweet us. But uh, EDF has got to be up there for sure. That's a low hanging fruit. But other names I'll mention: uh, Diversa for Lecce. You got to watch Lecce. They struggled down the stretch last year. Baroni for Hellas. Uh, I'm curious to see how he does there. Hellas struggled mightily last year. They have some talent still. Now the obvious names are going to be Dionisi from Sassuolo. That he he didn't have that great of a season last year. Can he bounce back? Rudy Garcia, sorry, sorry, Joe. Uh, but it's not just you. It's Inzaghi for, for Inter. Always. He's always on the hot seat, as is Pioli, Allegri. And uh, those are some of the, the, the names we always expect because they're, they're on the top teams. And so they're going to be one of the first names you mentioned when they're on, on a losing streak. So, But EDF has to be top. He has to be top. I mean, this squad for Frosinone is so painfully bad. 
and he's going to get the sack. And I don't think there's a single manager that could come in here and, and, and keep these guys up. Um, I just don't have the, I just don't have any faith. Um, you know, so it's, it, so it's hard not to say, uh, uh, Roberto, uh, Di, or Eusebio Di Francesco, excuse me. Yeah. Um, so other guys that, you know, I, I like some of the shouts that you mentioned, Richard, um, I'm going to just be defiant and tell Milan on Twitter that Pioli is not going to go. Uh, I love, I love picking on the Pioli out crowd. They're, they're fun. Um, no, we don't but, know this man, new management team. They could think be thinking differently, but I eh, it, it could, it, it, there, there's, there's certainly truth to that. I'll, I'll, I'll admit. Um, I could see things going wrong for Roberto Diversa at Lecce, uh, the second season syndrome and just kind of getting itchy. Hellas Verona is normally not very patient with managers. Marco Baroni may not be there that long if things don't go to plan. Those would be the guys that I'd probably have my closest eye on. The rest of these guys have, have been solid. You meant uh, Zanetti at Empoli, too, uh, could be another one. Keep an eye on that one. Yeah. Uh, uh, those would be the guys that I would probably, uh, you know, look at for the sack uh, at this point. Uh, let's get back to good things and let's get back to the players. We're just going to kind of go ebbs and flows here. Capocan uh, and Yeti, there's going to be a lot of contenders for it this season. Victor Alciman holds it. Um, Richard, your thoughts? Who's looking ahead? There's there's a lot of guys and a lot of shouts for it, uh, but uh, take your pick at Capocan and Yeti this year. Man, that is hard. Um, part of me wants to hope that Leao has a breakout year and just gets and gets twenty some goals this now year. Now be careful. Now we should footnote this. Hold on a second, because it is August thirteenth. Richard has a reputation for picking the Cabo Canieri in the preview pod, and then that guy is not even in City A by the by the deadline. Which so, would work in this situation. So please don't pick a Milan player. All right. Which would work in this situation. I was gonna say I, I'm hoping Leao can do it, but I don't. I, I'm not gonna put my laurels on him. The guy I think who is going to Cabo Canieri, who is going to Cabo Canieri. It's a guy who may not be in the league by end of the end of the month, and that's one Victor Osiman. Uh, he obviously won last year. That's a low hanging fruit, but I mean, if I look around the league, outside of you know Lartaro Martinez, who was formidable last year, Enzolo could have a fantastic year. I'm aware of this, and some other players. The one constant for me is Osiman. I think as long as he stays healthy, he's going to bag goals. He's going to bag goals. There's no other guy out there like an Icardi type, or you know he's going to bag goals. There's no Ronaldo in the league anymore, and so. The goal is going to be fairly spread out, I think, but I think Olsen is the one guy who's going to just grab most of them, and he's on a team that's pretty, just pretty much the same as it was last year. New manager, sure, but he's going to get he's going to get service, and he's going to put him away. He's a poacher; he does everything. He is a five tool, as we say in the states, a five tool player. He can do it all, and so Olsen for me, it's an easy pick. But now he's my Copa Air winner. Joe, yeah, just everything that that Richard said. <laughs> I can't see him not doing it, aside from. Yeah. As what is Saudi Arabia? Said, unless he gets hurt. Um, but th- I think Lautaro can make a, a really strong push for it. With with Jekyll and Lukaku, they're not there contributing goals. Uh, Lautaro's got to pick up the slack. I mean, we'll see if they bring in another striker, but I could see him. And he he was pretty close to Osiman for most of the season last season, just missed it by a couple goals. So if not Osiman, then I'm, I'm going with Lautaro. And you took mine now, Joe. Thank you. Uh, my pick is Lotaro Martinez this year. I, I just to get just to get sideways and just to get different. Um, I, I think that the service is there, the quality is there. I think Inter continue to get, uh, you know, to get better. Lotaro um, will be depended on for Inter to do great things. So I like him for Capo Caniari this season. I say keep an eye out for Mbala and Zola. Uh, you know, if Fiorentina, if he ends up becoming a regular starter, Osiman's always going to be in the conversation. Um, and then after that, there's really no one that I look at that I fancy for. Uh, Immobile, for, if he's healthy. It could be, yeah, Immobile, if he's healthy. Um, and then, you know, I, I can't pick an Atalanta guy because I don't know if Skamaka is really going to be the starter. We don't know what Gasparini is going to do with yeah. that situation. And then on top of that, Gasparini just subs guys just when you, when you least expect it, too. I mean, he's the worst at it. Um, uh, a lot of DraftKings money got lost playing Atalanta guys over the years because a, a guy's smashing for 45 minutes and then Gasparini, Gasparini yanks him and he's sitting there with a donut in the second half. But yeah. anyway, so uh, now moving on quickly, relegation. Um, okay, three new teams are up. Frosinone, Genoa, and help me with the other one. Damn it. Genoa, <laughs> Cagliari. Cagliari, sorry, thank you. Oh, with all due respect, George Widmer, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, 
And a lot of it is because George was hardly around last year. Yeah. So, yeah. He's back now. <laughs> so, He'll be back. Yeah. So now that he'll be back. Uh, all right. So those guys are new. Those guys are promoted. Certainly some teams were taking some steps back. Uh, I'll give you my three relegated right now. I think Lecce gets relegated this season. I just, you know, losing Hillman, they were on a decline here towards the end of the season last year. Um, I think they're going to face the drop. I think that Frosinone goes to face goes to the drop as well. Uh, I just don't think the I just don't think the squad is good enough, um, you know, relative to the demands of this season. And I'm going to finish with. Oh, man, I banged the drum for them so hard last year to survive, but I'm going to drop them this year. Hellas Verona. So, ah. <laughs> so for me, it's Hellas Verona, Lecce, Frosinone. Those are the teams that uh, end up getting the drop. Joe, how about you? Joe? Sorry, I, I got stuck on mute there. Uh, That's all right. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty in line with that. So I, I think for sure Frozen on and looking at their, their market so far, I mean, they're still linked to a few players, but I don't think they've done enough. And with the coaching change, I don't like their chances. I agree also on Lecce. Uh, for me, it's that third relegation team. You know, I think I think Genoa did really well in the market. I, I'm expecting them to stay up. I think... Cagliari have a pretty decent team, and, and they're both sort of familiar with the league, right? Longtime Serie A clubs. The the other two, uh, there's Verona, as you said, and then Hel- and sorry, um, Salernitana that I'm a little skeptical about, and that might be another coach going back to that conversation. Paolo Souza, we'll see. You know, if they don't have a good season, uh, he could be the first one to get the sack. He also recently came out and and I think was publicly critical of the club for not bringing in uh, enough players. So. I'm going to go with Frosinone, Lecce, and Salernitana. All right. Uh, Richard? Uh, yeah, Frank, you kind of took the words out of my mouth. Um, Frosinone, for sure, especially got EDF as your manager. Lecce, as much as I like them, I like the stories, I like the boys from UK, uh, I don't think they've done enough. You know, they struggled at the end of last year. I just like what people around them are doing more than what they've done. And then Hellas Verona, I think it's their time. Um, they, they scaved off relegation last season, but... I think Apple is a better team than them. I think Kyle, Kyle and Genoa have done so far are much are, have formidable, formidable their team much better than when what Hellas has at the moment. And then Salernitana, I think, also you know found something at the end of the last season, and I think I think they continue to ride that this year, especially with, with Dia coming back. So yeah, Hellas, Lecce, and Frosinone, bottom three. Okay, uh, so we are in lockstep on our bottom three. I'm interested to now hear what everybody thinks will be the top four. Um, well, no, I, you had Salernitana. Who'd you have Salernitana over, Joe? Over uh, Hellas Verona. Over Hellas Verona. Okay, yeah. so you're giving them, you're giving them a lifeline. Okay. Um, just barely. Right. <laughs> like I, just barely. I don't That's gonna be tight. That's gonna be tight. Yeah, yeah, it makes yeah. perfect sense. Okay, and the disclaimer for the final one here, guys, is that we do have a right to change this after the transfer after the transfer deadline, and once we know the teams are formalized. But if the deadline and if the deadline was today and transfers were over with today, uh, I want you guys to count seven down to one for me. Joe, I'm gonna have you go first. Oh man, okay, I'll have to reverse the order in my head because <laughs> I'm thinking top down. So, um, Richard, there's a screening process with bringing our guests on to be prepared for questions like this. What? I got my five caps. I think. How does Joe slip through this? <laughs> five, right, times. So five times. Five times. Uh, I'm gonna say Atlanta seven, uh, Roma six, Lazio five. Um, Sorry, guys. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put Milan fourth just because of the uncertainty, and I reserve the right to Frank's point to change that at the end of the mercato. Uh, and then I will go uh, Juventus third, and then being a typical Napoli homer, I'll, I'll say Inter second, then Napoli to to repeat as as much as Good you know. On. I don't want to jinx anything. Yeah, you know, I think it's realistic. <laughs> you deserved that. You earned that right last year with this good to win. So you can pick where the hell you want. <laughs> yeah. All right, Richard, seven down to one. Oh man, uh, that's this is gonna be hard. So I, I think there are, the, I think that the Scudetto race is gonna be four teams, very close, very very close. So whatever, whatever, whoever I put in fourth, third, whatever, any of them could win, and we have we can hold that right to change it at by the end of the month. Anyway, so seven, and this again, top ten is gonna be hard, I think, this year. But seven, Atalanta just barely over Fiorentina, six. 
I'm going to Lazio. Lazio losing SMS is going to be is going to hurt. Yes, they brought up some good pieces, but I think people around them have done more than what Lazio have done. Even though I think they've done really well. Number five, I like what Roma are doing this this summer. Some of the players they brought in, getting rid of Abanez, that's going to help them against Lazio, right? Uh, so that's going to definitely help them jump them in the standings there. Number four, ooh, uh, again, going to be close here. Joe, cover your ears. I'm picking Napoli. I don't trust Rudy Garcia just yet, but he's going to be in the mix. He's going to be in the mix for Scudetto. Three, ooh, I'm going to go in Inzaghi and Inter. I say Inter at three just because I think Juventus – they showed what they did last year. They were second best team last year outside of all the points, penalty points. I think, you know, as, as much as you can hate him, he gets the job, he gets points, he gets wins. That's what he does. And so Juve second, Milan first. I know that's a homer pick, but I like all the picks, you know, all the pieces that Milan picked up. It kind of filled in all the missing pieces that they had outside of the striker. And so, and you can argue Okafor is a, is a striker as well. So, I mean, I like what Milan doing. I, they could just bottle this like they did a couple years ago in the banter era, right? But uh, I think Milan did really well this Mercato. So, yeah, Milan, Juve, Inter, Napoli, my top four. Okay. Uh, for me, finally, uh, I'm with you all on seven. It's Atalanta, just edging it over Fiorentina. Um, uh, Lazio, sixth. I don't think we're going to have any surprises here with how you know with our top seven. I think it's all the same teams. It's just a matter of where you put it. I'm going to go with Juventus, fifth. Um, oh. I, I think that I'm going to bank on, I'm going to gamble on Allegri's tactics getting even more outdated to where the rest of these teams have caught on. Okay. Um, and are able to score, able to get, you know, take points off of the, the better teams taking points off of Juventus just cause they can get ahead early on them, take them out of, uh, take them out of what they like to do, which is manage their way through games. Um, so Juventus goes fifth for me. I think Roma make top four this season. Um, I, I like the signings. I like that Jose Mourinho is still there. I think there's a chip on a shoulder mentality with Roma with how the season ended last year, with how things went down at the Europa League, uh, with Mourinho's commitment to stay. Generally, when you see something for, with that, there's got to be something to show for it. Yeah, I do know. I get the third season syndrome with Jose Mourinho at other places where it hasn't gone well. I'm going to, I, I do have that into account, but I think this is a little bit different. Um, and I think that they're not done making moves to, to strengthen their team. And, and, and there's a little bit of a play on that, but I, I, I've got them with the squad they've got now. I think they're, they're fourth. Inter's third. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, and, and, and they're, just, they're good enough to win the title again. Um, and then I'm going to go Napoli second. Uh, I think that there's enough continuity for me that there's still going to be a top four side and that there's still going to be a Scudetto contender. I agree with Joe there, but I'm going with Milan for the title. It's not necessarily just a homer pick. Uh, I like how this team has reshaped. I think that Milan fans are going to need to be patient, though, over the first five or six games. I don't think they're going to like the football that they see while this all gets sorted out, while the team gets sorted out and they try to figure who they are, while Pioli tries to figure out what to do with all of these pieces. I think that there's an element of that that has to take place. But then I think they go on a run, um, you know, where with the, the pace that they have, um, you know, in the attacking areas and finally, you know, having a dynamic right winger. Uh, in a player like Chukwesi, something that has been long overdue for Milan to have, I think helps uh, tip things uh, for the Rossoneri to return to the podium uh, for the second time under Stefano Pioli. So so those are our top seven relegated Capocaninetti sack race transfer thoughts. At City House, sit down on Twitter or Instagram with your thoughts, and we are going to put a bow on this edition of City House, sit down, the season premiere for season eight. And uh, as we always do, we give the floor to our esteemed guest. And this time, Joe, have at it. Uh, plug away to all of our listeners and viewers. Absolutely. Well, first of all, that was so much fun. The hour and a bit flew by. Great chat, yes. as always. Uh, you can find uh, most of us, most of the content on uh, Forza Napoli Pod on all your usual social media channels. Uh, Forza Napoli Podcast on, on wherever you get your podcasts and uh, ForzaNapoliPress.com for uh, written content. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I'm at FTC underscore 21. Richard, I'll let you plug away. 
Yeah, uh, R underscore K H A R M E N. But more importantly, Syria sit down anywhere on, anywhere across social media. Uh, go to SyriaSitdown.com to try. We'll try to you know provide as much content as we can there as well. And then obviously the most importantly, follow our YouTube page and our Twitter. Uh, subscribe and like. Leave comments on our videos. That would help a lot. And uh, you know, Joe, thanks again for helping us out, man. Always fun doing these uh, previews and and just get your intake on Napoli and the league in general. I'm sure it's fun to talk not only just Napoli but other teams as well, right? Yep. No, uh, and, <laughs> oh, sorry to interrupt. Um, the uh, at City I sit down on Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it these days. Um, uh, and Richard, you might want to pin that the poll. Uh, go oh, there, yeah. and we 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 want to hear from you. What do you want to hear more of or see more of from us here in the coming season? Uh, you know, a lot of people want to see more player profiles. We've we've prided ourselves on getting ahead of everybody else on players as they emerge. Uh, so yeah, we will continue to do that. Uh, but you know, there's some other options in there, so we want you to please uh, interact with us and uh, tell us what you want to see more of. So um, chat. Good to see some names here. It's been a while since we've seen all seen you guys and uh, look forward to uh, getting connected with you guys here over the course of the season. It all starts this weekend. Uh, the for, We have 380 matches uh, to work through. Uh, we this have your, This coming weekend, yeah. 380, 380 games this weekend? No, 380 <laughs> games this season. Okay, okay. The first of which is going to kick off on, uh, I believe, is it Frosinone Napoli is the very first game, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, usually the champions. Okay, so the champions will kick us off first at Frosinone, and then we will uh, be off and running from there. We'll be back with a first impressions podcast uh, next week, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, and that'll do it. Uh, Joe, once again, thank you. We'll have you on again real soon. For Richard, I'm Frank. As always, make sure you tell your paisans about us. Ciao. Di